My series began with my love of peonies and pentagons. I'll start with the peonies. I love them for their beauty and variety, but beyond that, I enjoy the transition of each flower. Here are three pictures of the same flower as it aged and the petals became translucent. For me, this transition has parallels to the aging and dying processes. In fact, I love every stage of the peony life cycle from the tightly packed bud to the lush display of fresh petals to the withered petals that drop and leave what I call the crone. After brainstorming and experimenting, I decided to turn my peony photographs into custom printed fabrics. I designed many fabrics. Typically, I started with an image like this, cropped it, and then filled in the open spaces. This is how it looked printed on lightweight silk hobo tie. That same image was cropped further. I tried it in sepia tone and gray tone. Now I'm going to jump back five years to a visit to the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens to photograph their peony collection. Unfortunately, Mother Nature had her own plans which included a heavy rainstorm the night before my visit. When I got there the next day, I saw a lot of this. But I discovered that cropping the image created something dramatic. And if I turned it into gray tone, it seemed as if the flowers had disappeared and the leaves became prominent. Some of the other peony plants held up quite well through the overnight rain. I wanted to print this image onto fabric, but I had a problem. Custom printed fabrics can be expensive, especially when you need to print a lot of samples to decide what you like. Cottons can easily run $20 a yard, silks are often $50 a yard and up. Trying to save money, I split the image digitally, thinking I could then decide which side I preferred, the full color or the black and white. Thus buying one sample instead of two. When the sample came back, I realized it was the two together that created the most striking effect. I removed this garden marker, which may look very small here, but when people looked at the printed fabric, most everyone was distracted by it. Next, I cropped the image to focus on the leaves and converted it to sepia tone. I liked the image, so I went ahead and ordered two yards. When it came back from the factory, it was far more orange than I expected. I later realized if I had printed it on poly dock, it would have been closer to the colors I had envisioned. Now I had two yards of expensive orange fabric with distracting little faces, which are an artifact of the horizontal and vertical mirror repeats. I'll get back to this fabric later. This fabric design was based on my pentagon drawings. My love of pentagons has its origins in English paper piecing, which is a traditional patchwork method that involves wrapping fabric around precisely cut shapes to get exacting geometric forms. All the pieces are held together with hand stitching. Hexagons, not pentagons, are often used for English paper piecing, when sewn together, they form a continuous cloth, making them perfect for quilt tops. This is the back. The red basting stitches hold the fabric in place until the hexagons are hand stitched together, and then the papers can be removed. The red stitches remain as they do not show on the front. Each geometric shape has its own inherent patterns. Pentagons do not form a continuous cloth but they do form circles of 10. That's one reason I like pentagons so much. I like the idea of something straight edged suggesting a curve. Here's the back. As you can see, I often use contrasting thread to draw attention to the stitching. Long ago, I began to use sheer fabric because I like to reveal those hidden stitches. So I knew I wanted to use peonies and pentagons, but had no idea how I was going to put them together. I told a classmate 
I'm just going to make fabric with peonies and pentagons and see where that takes me. I'll worry about how to hang it later. Luckily, my classmate encouraged me to come up with a plan before I invested too many resources into something that might possibly fail. That night, before I fell asleep, I thought about my need for a plan. When I woke up the next morning, I thought about it again. This went on every night and every morning for nearly two months. Finally, one night I woke up at 3 a.m. and I had my answer. I wanted to work with the Tonka form, and I knew I had to do some research. Tonkas are a centuries-old Tibetan Buddhist religious art form. The first time I saw one was 35 years ago in a friend's living room. I was immediately taken by the gracefully draped cloth cover and how it conveyed reverence, majesty, and mystery. It was easy to understand why tonkas have been used for monastic student instruction and personal meditation focus. In traditional tonkas, the central image is often a Buddhist deity or scene. The drawings of faces and figures meet strictly prescribed ratios. Other traditional tonkas have a mandala in the center. Today, many tonkas are for sale. The central image may be a painting or sometimes a photocopy of a painting. In the 1960s, a number of private and commercial tonka painting schools and studios were established. Once you can recognize it, you will discover tonka imagery everywhere. This mandala can be digitally printed on a greeting card, tote bag, pillow, or even a shower curtain. This one is far more precious. It sold at a Christie's auction in 2014 for $45 million. It is done entirely in silk embroidery. Other tonkas are done in silk applique, such as this one made by Leslie Rinchen Wangmo. In fact, in Tibetan culture, silk applique is more highly prized than painting. Years ago, Leslie learned to make applique tonkas while living in Dharam Masala. She now lives in the United States and offers classes in the making of applique tonkas. Notice the details on the face, chin, ears, and flower. Each of those is outlined, and the outline is made from horse hair, which is first wrapped with silk thread using a sewing machine. Unlike American applique, the pieces are sewn to each other like puzzle parts rather than a single background fabric. Applique tonkas can be quite large with beautifully embroidered details. Tonkas come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Typically, this gigantic variety is brought out once a year, displayed a few hours, and then rolled up and returned to storage. While doing my research, I discovered this very helpful diagram by Anne Shaftel. Anne is an art conservator who works for museums, universities, governments, and monasteries. She is director of the Treasure Caretaker Training Digital Monastery Project, which offers trainings to Buddhist monks and nuns so they can protect and preserve the sacred art collections in their monasteries. I began to look for contemporary artists who had been inspired by Tonkas and discovered Faith Ringgold's Slave Rape series made in collaboration with her mother, Willie Posey Smith, who pieced fabrics to frame the paintings. Only recently I discovered Gonkar Gyatso. His striking photo series of self-portraits are reenactments of a 1937 photo of the Dalai Lama's senior Tonka painter. Gonkar was born in China-controlled Tibet and later moved to India and then to the United Kingdom more than 30 years ago. While in Dharam Masala, he studied Tonka painting. His current works include paintings, installations, and mixed media, where he uses a lot of stickers, and sculptures also covered with many stickers. After all this research, I concluded I was most drawn to the Tonka's cloth frames and draped covers. 
I spent a lot of time thinking about the implications of using the Tonka form. I asked myself, what do peonies and pentagons have to do with each other? Is it enough that I simply like the way they look together? And what do flowers have to do with my spirituality? I am not a Buddhist. I am a Jew with Buddhist leanings and an interest in world art and world textiles. The more I thought about this, the more I thought about my favorite prayer written by Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav, who lived in Eastern Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries. May it be my custom to go outdoors each day among the trees and grass, among all growing things, and there may I be alone and enter into prayer to talk with the one that I belong to. May I express there everything in my heart, and may all the foliage of the field, all grasses, trees, and plants, may they all awake at my coming to send the powers of their life into the words of my prayer, so that my prayer and speech are made whole through the life and spirit of all growing things, which are made as one by their transcendent source. Around this time, I decided pentagons and sheer fabrics would be my symbols for the transformations of peonies and other transformations, such as chemical changes and spiritual changes. They also symbolize our efforts to make sense of spirituality and science. I spent a lot of time measuring photos like this one and eventually contacted Leslie Rinch and Wangmo to learn how the draped covers are made. Tonka covers begin as a flat piece of cloth. Traditionally, the cover was not raised until the right moment. In some cases, the covers served to protect the uninitiated from seeing images they were not ready to see. Sometimes, even the large hillside tonkas have a cover. In this case, the cover was split up the center, a technique also used on smaller tonkas. Sometimes the cover is simply tossed over the top, but by far this is the form that interested me the most, especially this one because of its triple cover and door. Doors are an optional tonka feature. If the central image is the home of the Buddhist deity, the rectangle below is the door, the way into the deity's home. I had already planned to use window screening as a reminder of the difference between looking outside and being outside. Now I knew where to place it. This tonka also interested me. The shading in the door fabrics make it look out of focus. It plays tricks on your eyes. The piecing reminded me of English paper piecing. Traditional tonka frames are sewn by tailors, not painters. For my frames, the focus was on keeping everything straight. In college, I did exacting precise work, such as complex woven patterns and silk screened fabrics. I even took a tailoring class. But in more recent years, I have enjoyed the relaxation of watercolor painting, which allows me to go with the happy accidents and not seek perfection. This return to precision was not easy. To keep everything lined up, I used freezer paper, drew a lot of lines, used a lot of clips, and took a lot of measurements over and over. I looked for a way to attach the central image. Because I enjoy hand stitching, I chose the prick stitch, a variation on the back stitch. It involves catching two or three threads on the front. Only later I remembered this same stitch is often used by tailors to top stitch coat and jacket collars. Typically, I made these tiny stitches through three layers of felt, two layers of canvas, six layers of sheer silk, and many layers of misty fuse. I also played with different options for the screen door. Gradually, as the first three artworks took form, they began to remind me of the seasons. The colors and imagery of this one remind me of spring. A rhythmic pattern of small pentagons was hand screened across the background. More pentagons were added to symbolize energy coming up from the earth. The cover was hand dyed and then hand screened. Metal pieces were added to the corners to give a feeling of age and architecture. 
The vivid colors in this piece felt like summer. Thinking about the double helix of genetics, I printed two intertwining paths which cross at the bottom and again at the top, beneath the cover, because even when nature is in your face, something still remains unseen. A simple rectangle of window screen was spray painted bronze gold, and a tear was added to the screen to symbolize the approach of autumn's decay. The cover was custom printed and then pentagons were hand screened along the edges. This is autumn. In very dim lighting, the background appears to be solid black. Sometimes it's so dark the circular door disappears into the background. Remember that orange fabric with all the little faces on it? It became this background. By adding layers of sheer black silk and metallic paints, I was able to tone down the color and obscure those unwanted faces. The black silk door is stitched with metallic thread. To create a weathered look, the edges of the cover and ribbons were distressed. It was time to think about winter. I had intended to use this silk charmeuse, but it was too dark for snow, so I flipped it over. After screening metallic pentagons, I was afraid that the photographic textures would be obscured by the next layer, which was to be a sheer silk. So I brushed on polymer medium. This is how it looked before it dried. The polymer medium did help, but it cannot be ironed or it will turn yellow. So this technique is not quite as clever as I first thought. I wanted winter to be tattered with the wear and tear of time, so I distressed and tore the gauze cover and ribbons. For the cover, I was thinking of layers of snow and printed white pentagons on silk and then covered it with more silk. English paper piecing was added in the corners of the central image. Instead of a door, paint was sprayed through a screen to suggest a screen that was not there. In the end, this series moved from a study of peonies and pentagons to a contemplation of beauty, decay, and spirit. Many people helped with this series in many different ways. Some brought me peonies or welcomed me into their gardens. Others provided a listening ear or an insight into an artistic question. Some provided workspace or technical assistance. Thank you for your interest and taking the time to listen. I welcome your questions and can be reached at this email address.